Did he jump or was he pushed? I'm afraid I cannot do that. It's not in our national interest. I don't want to put that in front of my parliament because I don't think I could recommend it uh, with a, a clear conscience. And so I'm going to say no and I'm going to exercise the veto. That is effectively what I did. David Cameron says he's made the right choice for Britain. But was it a choice made for him by European leaders? And did he walk away with anything? Well, he certainly enhanced his reputation as a defender of the national interest. Alas, for Britain, this summit was meant to be about coming together decisively to act in the common good. We'll be asking the Europe Minister whether his leader has put Britain on a path out of the EU. And there's that small matter of the crisis that started all of this. Paul Mason's here. The new EU budget rules make spending your way out of recession illegal. So where is Europe's growth going to come from? We assess whether this summit has done anything to take the euro out of the danger zone. And what the past 24 hours has done to British politics. Thrilled Tory backbenchers, nervous Liberal Democrats, how easily now can they coalesce? Good evening. Or is it Auf Wiedersehen, England? So read the banner headline in one German magazine today. 26 members of the European Union are probably going to negotiate a new treaty to help make the single currency work. Britain is not. David Cameron said he had to veto a treaty of all 27 because the others wouldn't give special protections to our financial services industry. Eurosceptics are thrilled and Liberal Democrat ministers are trying not to look too glum. But you might say it's a strange kind of veto that doesn't prevent the thing that the government wanted to stop and doesn't win the city any more protection from Brussels than it already has. Our diplomatic editor Mark Urban was there and is still there now. Mark, what did happen? Well, it was always going to be complicated. If David Cameron had gone along with what the others wanted, then there would have been this process of treaty change triggering all sorts of legislative and political steps in the member countries. But because he didn't want to go along with it, and that process, by the way, would have taken months, people say, until March to produce the sort of effects that, that people were looking at. So it was never going to be a quick fix. But because David Cameron said no and did use his veto, a pretty major major moment in European history, they can now blame him for things that go wrong subsequently. They call this the family photo, but this clan now has a black sheep. After a night in which Britain had found itself alone on the new package of measures to protect the euro, there was an attempt to make up between Britain's habitual antagonists. But there was no disguising that the decision to veto EU treaty changes left David Cameron a lonely figure this morning and allowed Nicolas Sarkozy to apportion blame. As to your question about our British friends, in order to accept a reform of the 27-nation treaty, David Cameron proposed something we all thought was unacceptable, namely there would be a treaty written into the protocols that would allow the UK to opt out of rules regarding financial services. Having gone on until five this morning, some other countries were ready to be even blunter in describing Europe's new alignment. Brit, not Europe, Brits divided and they are outside of decision making. Europe is united. In the press room, those with various political axes ground them energetically this morning, giving their interpretation of what had happened and where it left Britain. Cameron's been wandering around this building virtually alone. We've had Sarkozy spitting with venom. I fear the City of London will have a very heavy price to pay for all of this in terms of legislation coming down the road. And when Cameron goes back to the United Kingdom, if he thinks that by vetoing a treaty, he's appeased Eurosceptic debate, he's got another thing coming. People see this as a sort of uh, definitive placing of Britain on the margins of the EU. Is that right? Well, let's remember that the monetary union is only one aspect of what the European Union does. The bulk of decision-making in the EU remains a matter for all 27 member states. Of course, the narrative of Britain's isolation in Europe is such a well-worn one that 
the press can always be relied upon to lap it up. Downing Street has tried to combat it in recent weeks by suggesting the UK might be at the head of a whole group of countries outside the euro that shared similar views. But last night really gave the lie to that. And the question now for the coming months is how Britain is going to exert any kind of influence in the discussions that lie ahead. For months, the 17 of the Eurozone have been central to this crisis and the 10 other members of the EU peripheral. Last night, six of those others agreed to back the Franco-German plan. Additionally, Hungary, the Czech Republic and Sweden referred it for parliamentary approval. That left only the UK unambiguously opposed. Mr Cameron now cast doubt over whether Europe's institutions, particularly the Commission, effectively its civil service, should be allowed to support the other nations moving ahead when one nation objects. The institutions of the European Union belong to the European Union. They belong to the 27. They're there to do the things that are set out in the treaties uh, that we've all signed up to uh, over the years. And that is an important protection for Britain. However, those running the EU beg to differ, arguing they can throw their organisational weight behind those countries that have signed up to the fiscal compact. This formula has some handicaps, but we will try to overcome them. Uh, and I think we, have, we will need a, a large interpretation uh, of the role of institutions and others, as we did it in the past. Pushing on without changes to Europe's key treaties does, though, threaten a power struggle. The new fiscal compact strengthens the role of the Commission, the unelected officials. But what about the other two pillars of the EU, the Council, its 27 member governments collectively, and the European Parliament? There were already rumblings in Brussels today. This is possible if it is a copy-paste of the existing treaty, with the same role for the European Commission as today and with the same democratic control for, by the European Parliament because I cannot accept that we shall have a whole economic governance inside the Eurozone and inside the European Union without a democratic control by the European Parliament. So for those processing what everyone apart from Britain agreed, there are many open questions still. This could take months of negotiation and create its own diplomatic gridlock. That's not fast enough for countries that want the underlying sovereign debt problem solved quickly. We have new governments in Italy and Spain. We have signals from both of them that they are doing more to address their, uh, their economies in deep distress. That's the most important step to take. Uh, I think that these governance issues are of importance, but it's much more related to the crisis management. Britain's exit from this negotiating process is a gamble. Quite apart from the UK domestic aspect, it's complicated life for the others. They're unlikely to forget that in the Eurozone's hour of need, Mr Cameron put national interest first, and they may not forgive him either. That was Mark Urban there in Brussels. Well, before we came on air, I spoke to David Liddington, the Minister for Europe. Minister, what was David Cameron so frightened of last night that he had to take this step? The position he was faced with was that if he accepted a treaty at the level of 27, that would be an amendment to the treaty governing the whole of the European Union, its institutions, the way it does business. And there was a real risk that without the safeguards that he wanted included in that treaty at 27, that you would, over time, have a read across from the closer fiscal integration that the Eurozone countries want to do towards measures that would influence financial services in particular, but also the single market as they affect Europe at 27. But it's such an odd kind of veto because the thing you wanted to stop is going to happen without those safeguards. I mean, aren't you worried about that? Well, I think, I mean, clearly we have to be vigilant, um, not just on financial services, but over British interests more widely within the European Union. But, but if, if you look, Stephanie, if you look at what's actually happened over the last 12 months, what you've seen is a number of initiatives coming forward where George Osborne and his Treasury team have negotiated very hard, where they've worked with other European countries who have oh, agreed with our views, right. and they've got a lot of that legislation in a form that we have been able to live with. And with this decision that David Cameron's taken, 
you actually think it's do you think it's really more likely that that's going to happen in the future or less likely oh i think that people are going to continue to work on the basis of common interests they are going ahead with this they're irritated with what we've done realistically surely there is a more chance now that they're going to go ahead with things that the city doesn't like than there was a few weeks ago where we might still have had a small amount of goodwill there was i think there is an inherent risk in the euro that you could get the growth of rival blocks and we have to work to avoid that and i've never pretended that risk was absent but what i think is a mistake is to see that the eurozone or the eurozone plus or the eurozone outs are all monolithic cohesive blocks what you've got are countries particularly in the eurozone that have come together for a particular purpose yes um and we actually want them to succeed in getting okay. back to economic well, stability. Well, but, 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 yeah, just to, if I can finish, finish the point, that, that who on many issues have a huge overlap of interest with the UK, and you talk to a lot of Eurozone countries and they will say, we want to continue working with you precisely to resist okay. protectionist tendencies but we see elsewhere. I'm interested to know, do, you, do, you, do we want this to succeed, this treaty with 26 members? Is it in, do we actually want it well, to I succeed? Well, I, I mean, to be honest, I, I never believed that a treaty was going to be the key to solving the problems of the eurozone i so think that the problems of the, the problems of the eurozone it's certainly in british interest that the eurozone sorts its problems out but the key to that is first of all dealing with the immediate crisis through working out the details of the greek debt the bank recapitalization and the strengthening of the efsf so this is so this is an irrelevance and that's why we don't want them to use it's we don't want to help them by allowing no, them to use european union institutions not, and resources it's not an it's not an irrelevance when you have a change to the treaty of lisbon which because that treaty governs all the european institutions and the a way in which the european union legislates can have an impact upon our vital economic interests. You are Europe Minister. You must have some sympathy with your uh, counterparts in Europe who would say, you know, they're saying that they've made a principled decision. This just seems petty. I mean, it's not winning any friends at all, this move, is it? I think that what we have to make clear is that we, yes, will stand up for British national interests when it comes to a decision, but that we also continue to want the Eurozone to work successfully to restore economic stability. And if you listen to what, you know, just sure you did, to what Chancellor Merkel said in her press conference after the summit was concluded, she said that we, she would be continuing to work with David Cameron and the United Kingdom. And what do you think of Paddy Ashdown saying that this is 40 years of UK diplomacy down the drain? No, I think, I think that is an exaggeration. And I think that uh, if I look at what Nick Clegg said, I look at what Min Campbell have said today, you will see, I think, that the Liberal Democrat leadership accepts that the Prime Minister, given the choice that faced him last night, had uh, no option other than to take the decision he did. Isn't this the start of a road that leads quite quickly to us leaving the EU? No, because there are important British interests, which I think... Uh, mean that we are right to remain as members of the European Union. But it's Union. 26 and 1. 26 countries who've carried on and who've got their treaty and everything else, and one country outside. You really think that's no, sustainable? No, because you're looking at a structure under which decisions about the regulation of economic affairs will be taken at the level of 27, in which the discussions about foreign and security policy will be continued to be taken at the level of 27, where the United Kingdom is one of the leading European countries. David Lidington, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we'll have more on the politics of all this in a minute, but now, big bazookas. That's what Paul Mason and I thought we'd be talking about today. David Cameron said the Eurozone needed to come up with one, an overwhelming show of force to set fear into the heart of any hedge fund manager planning to make money from the Euro Euro's demise. But it doesn't seem to have turned out that way. Germany's persuaded the others to make the Eurozone look a lot more, well, German. And there's little sign that Chancellor Merkel or the European Central Bank are offering to use their big bazookas in return. Paul is here. Paul, have they done, have they fixed it? Have they, or at least have they done what they were trying to do today? Most people in the markets think not. And it will be the markets that decide this. I think what people think is that the thing they did yesterday where the European Central Bank 
pumped money into the uh, banking system, uh, made borrowing very easy to do for banks, will work and will stop the banks collapsing in this ever-increasing credit crunch that we're, we're seeing in Europe. But when it comes to the actual sovereigns, the countries that could go bust, uh, the, the problem remains. This is a graphic produced by Capital Economics, uh, a, a London consultancy, and it shows that what we... look. Spain and Italy need to borrow about a trillion over the next three years. They can't borrow now because perfectly non-speculative people like pension funds don't want to lend it to them because they fear they might lose it. And then they have to write to people saying, we've lost your money. So it has to come from what we thought would be the bazooka mark two. This is what it could look like, look like according to these economists. The EFSF, this is alphabet soup I'm afraid, but EFSF, the, the fund we have now, taxpayers' money against which they'll borrow some more. That takes you to there, about half a trillion. There's another half trillion from the ESM, that's the successor to the EFSF, but they could run in parallel. In a and minute I'm going to ask you what all those stand for. But I don't, no, don't dare. <laughs> There's another bit. Uh, um, this is the IMF, and that's going to get some money from Europe and lend it back to Europe. So look, there theoretically is the bazooka. It's and, big enough. And Your theoretically, bazooka, the it's big, big enough. enough. There's only one problem. That EFSF thing at the bottom is countries borrowing, okay? Now, if these countries' growth should collapse, then and Standard & Poor's comes up overnight and says, you, you can't borrow anymore at the rates you did, the thing itself collapsed. Their borrowing ability falls apart. And a lot of people in the markets think that is actually what's going to happen. S&P will downgrade people, so, and it will be goodbye to the bazooka. And you've got one question mark in that chart. I mean, you could say that all of that is one big question mark, because we don't actually know whether any of that's Yeah, but this happen. bottom one is the one we've been trying to do for six months. <laughs> At least we know what that might look like. The, the, the middle one, um, yeah, it's... Um, but, I mean, it's odd, though, because you say the markets have sort of said this is not enough, but, that, you know, they're sort of, they're not happy with it, but nor have they tanked today. I mean, what, no, what's no. going on? No, no, I mean, look, I, I think there's sheer shock, actually, at one level. But, look, the small print, it's not that small, actually. It's 10 points, and it's in there. Uh, the key bit of detail in the thing today is that, in future, Eurozone governments aren't allowed to have a structural deficit over 0.5% of their GDP. To, for comparison, Britain's is currently four and a half, and after four years of uh, George Osborne's austerity, we'll get it down to two and a half. Okay, so that's a big ask. And what's worrying the bond markets is, okay, if you're going to impose austerity, where does growth come from? And one bar bond market participant to me was very uh, straight with me on this. I think we need a fiscal union uh, to accommodate uh, a monetary union. But what we've got looks... Uh, much more like an austerity union. Uh, we've got limits on deficits, uh, we've got big push to reduce spending. And this reduced government spending looks set to come at the same time as banks tighten up and they reduce private sector spending. And that kind of constitutes a double whammy to growth. Well, thanks very much, Paul, for that. Well, we're going to cast our eye a bit more over the summit deal and work out if the euro and the world economy has actually been saved tonight with Baroness Videra the former Labour Minister and advisor to the G20. And from Vienna, Gertrude tumpel gugerell who was a member of the European Central Bank Executive Board for the past eight years. And we're also joined from California by Mohamed al CEO of PIMCO, by far the world's largest bond trader. I should probably start with you, Mohamed al because you're the one that we worry about. You're the ones with your trillion dollars in your fund. You could make or break this thing. Are you, are you piling in? or getting out even faster as a result of the last day? So I don't think we can make it or break it, but our assessment is they took some important steps, but they're not sufficient. So this is neither a quick fix, nor is it a comprehensive fix. So we remain on the sideline in terms of engaging in the bond markets of the most um, vulnerable European economies. But that, I mean, that is quite a bad result because we were being told, you know, all these things about 10 days to save the euro or five days to save the euro. I mean, this was supposed to bring a step change in the thinking of people just like you. So think of it in the following way. Everybody recognizes that the eurozone building is very fragile. So the eurozone is now building another building and all they've done is just laid the foundation. They haven't yet put the different floors on, so people are not going to move from the old building to the new building. They're going to move from the old building out. And that's why Europe has to accelerate what it's putting in place. It's not enough to simply put a foundation and say, we're going to come back in March and build another few floors for you. 
Uh, Gertrude Tumpel Gugarel, you are sitting in the, or you used to be sitting in the institution that's supposed to be one of the flaws of that solution. We keep on talking about the European Central Bank being a crucial part of the, 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 the final, the, the end, end solution to the euro. Do you think that that's going to change, that the, euro, the euro, European Central Bank is going to come in now? The euro, European Central Bank has been in different kinds of measures to uh, bring uh, Europe out of the crisis. We should not underestimate this. And um, if we look at the results of the summit, there are three major achievements. The first one is a long-term commitment to sound fiscal policies. There is uh, additional funds are made available, uh, considerable funds to help countries to bridge difficult periods. And the third element is the uh, International Monetary Fund comes in uh, and is a very, very good um, name, I would say, also to support the credibility of, of these different uh, but, measures taken. But so the people. The European Central Bank, yeah. Well, just the people, for the last week, partly thanks to something that the European Central Bank president seemed to suggest about a week ago, people have thought that if there was this kind of commitment to tough fiscal rules, there'd be some kind of reward from the European Central Bank. Are you suggesting that, that, that that's just wrong, that there won't be any quid pro quo? Uh, the solution can come only f uh, from building new confidence in the in the country's policies so the solution can come only from the country's government themselves what the european central bank has done and uh, has done in the past and can do in the future is first of all providing liquidity this is the major uh, task of a central bank in such a situation. The ECB has taken such a step yesterday by deciding to provide three years liquidity and the European Central Bank has still its uh, uh, government bond purchase program uh, available. But, uh, but the solution cannot come, yeah, the solution cannot come from the central bank alone. This is very clear. Well, that's something we have heard quite a few times before in the last few months. That's what the European Central Bank tends to say. I mean, with your sort of G20 hat on, Sridhar Vidara, if you're looking at this from the outside, is there enough here? Does the European Central Bank need to do more? I don't think there is enough here at the moment. Uh, what we wanted from this summit, and we should actually stop expecting something for in one day, but what we wanted was, first of all, clarity on an end destination, and secondly, a bridge of liquidity for sovereign bonds to that destination. I think we sort of half got both but we haven't got all of it, and it's only the next few months that will tell. The problem is we don't know if we've got a few more months to play out. We will probably have a downgrade, as Paul has said, uh, in the next few weeks, and at that point, that liquidity will be tested. Is the ECB going to step in? And actually, there does need to be a, a reward. There needs to be, the compact does have to be on both sides of this. They could buy in the secondary market, but they are, at the moment, the only institution in the structure that is able to act. The rest of the money isn't ready yet. And what do you say to, uh, to Paul Mason's point that actually if, this, if these fiscal rules happen, you know, what you tried to do in uh, 2009 in London when you had all countries announce big you know, stimulus packages wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible now with any country in the Eurozone? Do you, think that's, do you think that's right? I think that it is true that they've produced a toolkit with only one tool in it, which is austerity. It's about debt caps and uh, uh, de uh, def deficit caps. Actually, the real problem with the countries who are in trouble right now is their current account. They're not competitive enough. There's really nothing in here that shows that these countries are going to be able to trade their way. They, they can't inflate they can't depreciate, they can't borrow cheaply, they don't get any money from the ECB, they don't get money from any, something's got to give. And it could let, end up with solvency problems and really consigning Europe to 10 years of absolutely no growth. If there is a solvency problem and nobody gives them any funding, then we're going to be looking at restructurings of debt. Mohamed El Arian, I mean, as an economist, you must worry a bit about where the growth is going to come from in this scenario. I mean, it's, it's all fiscal. It's all about tightening budgets. The European Central Bank is saying it doesn't necessarily want to do any more. Do you worry about that? Oh, absolutely. It's, w it's one of the five things that I worry. In fact, they are the list to assess summit after summit. One is you, debt solvency has a numerator and denominator. Numerator is debt and deficit. 
But the denominator is important, is how quickly you grow and generate income and pay off your debt. There isn't enough focus on that. Second, as you heard, there's no vision for what the Eurozone is going to look like in three years' time. Third, the banking system is still a mess. We still have capital inadequacy, asset quality is a problem. Fourth, we haven't had a clear signal between liquidity problems and sovereignty problems. And as long as we don't delineate clearly between them, there's going to always be question mark. And finally, the big bazooka, which is the ECB, hasn't really come in. I sympathize with the ECB because so far they've done a lot, but they've been a bridge to nowhere. They need to be a bridge to somewhere. But once that somewhere is known, which is not, they have to come in. So it's a long list. Growth is the first item there, but it's not the, the only item there. Gertrude uh, tumba very, very briefly, I mean, uh, surely the European Central Bank, it says it doesn't want to be a lender of last resort, but as long as the crisis continues, you'll have, the, the ECB is having to do a lot of emergency support for banks. Aren't you suffering from the fact that this crisis is not being resolved and that there isn't going to be enough growth? Growth comes from addressing structural problems, and of course it's a concern. Um, we, we see that growth prospects for next year are weaker, and we should take into account that the aim of the fiscal measures is to limit the structural deficit, which of course takes into account also the, the uh, business cycle growth. situation. That hurts growth. In, yeah. But that hurts growth, yeah, I but, mean, and structural uh, reforms hurt growth. It's, it's reforming labour markets, it's doing things that in the short term might actually slow down economies. But as, as we have seen from various countries, I think a number of measures have been taken in the last few uh, years. And if you look at um, Spain, for instance, Spain has tried to address its problems in the, in the labor market. Okay. It's in a very difficult situation, but is trying to reform the labor market in a direction where it will have more possibilities for employment. Thank you. Uh, the same is true for other, for other countries as well. Okay. But, but uh, you should take into account the fiscal rule is addressing the structural deficit. The structural deficit takes into account the business cycle situation. Okay, we have to leave so it there. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we have, to, we have to cut it off. Well, fog in the channel, continent cut off. The old joke doesn't sound so funny today because it's pretty clear where the rest of Europe wants to go from here. It's Britain's future that seems clouded in doubt. And that includes, surely, the future of the coalition between Eurosceptic Conservatives and Europhile Liberal Democrats. Here's David Grossman's assessment. Right now, Europe's top duo are apparently so fused in their common purpose they're known by the single name Mercosi. The joke doing the rounds at Westminster is that had David Cameron joined them in a treaty, well, it wouldn't quite have spelt kamikaze, but politically it could have amounted to much the same thing. It would have been like the Maastricht Treaty row of some 20 years ago, except far worse, um, because he would have had to bring a bill before Parliament to bring the treaty into effect. There would have been amendments to the bill, with Bill Cash and the critics who were around 20 years ago coming back for a second bite, except in a stronger position now. There'd have been an amendment calling for a referendum. There could even have been a leadership challenge. The morning after in Brussels, though, was very different. Soft music, warm handshakes, and David Cameron sticking his signature on the dotted line. It's just that this was the paperwork for Croatia to join the EU, not the treaty that most of Europe wanted. This does represent a change in our relationship with Europe, but the core of our relationship, the single market, the trade, the investment, the growth, the jobs that we want to see, that remains as it was, and it's very important, that fact. In terms of the future and referendums and all the rest of it, we're not going to be presenting a treaty to Parliament. Other countries have signed, are going to be signing up to a treaty that has some quite invasive aspects in terms of their sovereignty, their ability to set their own budgets and set their own rules. Now, it's going to be a matter for them how they deal with their parliaments. We won't be taking a treaty like that to our parliament. Final. The ins and outs of the politics of this are pretty tricky for David Cameron, and they're pulling him in two different directions. The Liberal Democrats think that Britain should do whatever it takes to stay in the European club, even if that means getting out of the coalition. Meanwhile, plenty of Conservative backbenchers think we should use this as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to renegotiate better terms, if not entirely out of the EU, definitely closer out than firmly in. 
It is nearly 20 years since John Major's government was brought to the very brink by splits over Europe. One of the leaders of that rebellion is clear yesterday's veto should only be the start. There are many people who think that perhaps we uh, have been proved pretty well on the, on the nail. What I'm saying is this, that uh, there is a necessity to tackle the nature of the European Union as it now is. And I've said repeatedly in the debate yesterday, for weeks, indeed for months, if not years, that we have to have a fundamental renegotiation of the treaties in our relationship to the European Union. Paul Goodman used to be a Conservative MP and now writes for the Tory grassroots website Conservative Home. So he's pretty well tuned in to how Conservative MPs are thinking. There's been a tide of Euroscepticism flowing through the Conservative Party for the last 25 years since Thatcher's Bruce speech. And what this extraordinary veto has done, this amazing event, is it's given that tide another big push. And after this, the question that a lot of Conservative backbenchers will be asking is, well, we've always been told we've got to be in the EU because of our national interest and because we have to be at the heart of Europe. If we're not, and we're going to be at the edge, we have to renegotiate a completely new relationship because what's the point of being at the edge but governed by all the rules? While many Conservatives are clearly delighted, this is a very difficult time for Nick Clegg, leader of the Liberal Democrats, a former MEP and pro-European to his core, like much of his party. At the same time, of course, though, he is in coalition with David Cameron. Any uh, Eurosceptic who might be rubbing their hands in glee about the outcome of the summit last night should be careful for what they wish for because clearly there is potentially an increased risk of a two-speed Europe in which Britain's position becomes more marginalised and in the long run that would be bad for growth and jobs in this country. But other Liberal Democrats are keener to pin the blame on the Prime Minister. I think David Cameron has let us down very, very badly. It's not simply a matter of the written declarations which uh, you know, end up as, as treaties of one form or another. It's all about relationships. And what happened at the, the dinner last night in Brussels was that the 17 countries in the Eurozone gathered amongst the 27 of the European Union and said, we need help. We need to give them the financial markets some confidence about the direction of the Euro, that we are united in going forward. We need to make arrangements uh, as quickly as possible and we needed the help of everyone to do that. And David Cameron effectively said, I'm not prepared to help. I'm not prepared to lift a finger. In fact, he went worse than that. He kicked them in the teeth, and that will not be forgotten. So could Europe then split the coalition? Well, after so many supposedly impossible things have already happened, well, nothing appears completely out of the question. David Grossman, well, where, where does this leave the coalition? With me is the Liberal Democrat, Lord Oakeshott, and the Conservative MP, Bernard Jenkin. Bernard Jenkin, I mean, for you and other Eurosceptics, I mean, this is brilliant news, isn't it, what happened? Well, can I just make a criticism, which is there's an awful tendency in the BBC to turn this into a narrative about the coalition and about the Conservative Party. This is actually about the substance of an issue, and it's about the substance of an issue of which the Eurosceptics have broadly been demonstrated to be right. And how much of this, this programme have we right. spent talking about the substance no, of the no. issue, and how well, much have we spent talking well, about Well, we this? had your opening... Uh, report saying, alas for Britain, well, you know, we're isolated. Well, the this whole is interesting. So you don't been... think that this is significant for the relationship I do within think the coalition? This. I do think this is very significant. And I think, I think Matthew is going to think this is very significant. I think everybody should regard this significant. That we are, we are now in a new situation, in a new relationship with our European partners, because they are going off and doing something on their own, okay. and we are not involved. But the foundations for that were laid at the Maastricht Treaty. And this moment was always going to become inevitable. And some of us have been saying that for a very okay. long time. And we now must face the consequences of it. And I think David Cameron has faced the consequences. He's confronted it at Brussels. Lord Oakeshott, I mean, Nick Clegg said there that uh, Eurosceptics shouldn't be celebrating. Can you think of one reason why they shouldn't? Well, they I'm not be celebrating. They shouldn't be celebrating. I mean, they are celebrating. You're just I saying mean, I told you They so. are celebrating. Bernard, Bernard Jenkins has been a serial rebel. He's been, uh, with Ian Duncan Smith, uh, been leading the, the opposition effectively to our membership of the European no, Union. I mean, that's and, not true. Uh, uh, you know, he's now saying, We told you so. The fact is that this is a very damaging day for Europe and for Britain. He says, he says that Europeans have gone off on their own. They haven't. Britain has cut itself off 
from our main trading partners, our main allies, our main friend. It's deeply dangerous and millions of jobs in Britain, all over Britain, not a few hundred thousand in the city, have been put at risk by this very, very dangerous move. Well, Bernard Jenkins, we've given up quite a lot. And as we were discussing earlier, we've, given, not, we given we've up? not got a lot. What have we given up? We've given up a place at a table with 26 others who are no, deciding no, no. things. What, what have we given up? We're, we're, as David Cameron was explaining, we are still in the 27. All the, the entire treaty structure is still answerable to the 27, as it was before. What has changed? The only thing that has changed is that the other member states have decided to go off on their own and do something on their own because they cannot conceive of respecting a national interest, a, a relatively modest demand, I have to say. And many of us would have liked David Cameron to Excuse make much me. greater Excuse demands. Excuse me, are you, seriously, very modest are you demands. seriously suggesting that Angela Merkel for Germany and Nicolas Sarkozy for mm. France are not defending their national interest? Of Don't they be are. ridiculous. Of course they are. Don't be ridiculous. So they're saying, now the fact is are. that we, this is the end game of a desperately silly decision by David Cameron when he was trying to buy right-wing votes against Liam Fox in the leadership election to leave the mainstream European grouping. He would have been there in Marseille with the Angela Merkel uh, uh, and Nicolas Sarkozy oh, this, this, and Spain, and he's mm. off with the headbangers and the wackos in Eastern mm. Europe, and no. we are losing influence all the time. Well, can I just deal with you that know. point? If we'd had no. a Labour Prime Minister, would he have been at that dinner? No, he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. Well, there he you wouldn't. are. You're but talking that's not rubbish. the point. But no, but no, the you're point talking is, rubbish. No, I'm not. Because they have their allies, whereas for many years, mm. the Conservative Prime Ministers, you may not have liked it, but Conservative Prime Ministers, with a lot more experience, frankly, than David Cameron, were there in alliance with the main players on the European right, and now they are completely isolated and marginalised. Now, but what really matters is that the British Prime Minister has been doing special pleading for special interests in the city, and uh, conciliating people like you, who've never accepted the coalition agreement, you're always asking for a referendum which is not in the agreement, instead of putting the British national interest first. Bernard Jenkins, do you think that uh, this does inevitably lead to a renegotiation of well, our relationship I with mean, the I'll, I'll just put it this way. We you now, seem to be a bit torn about yeah, whether no, a lot has I, happened or not I, very much. I, I you do, want I, us I, to come I, out, don't I, you? I Why do not openly and honestly say I so, do, and then I we know where we are. I think this inevitably leads to renegotiation. And if we don't get that renegotiation, that will be driving us towards the exit. And that's why I want a renegotiation, because I want us to remain in the European Union. But just ask, I mean, it's the thing, not in the coalition but, agreement. Well, you I, are trying to wreck the coalition agreement. Unfortunately, the, which coalition we all agreement, the coalition agreement has been overtaken by events. It is not. It, uh, it the is not. There's nothing about renegotiation in there. The co coalition agreement you did know. not envisage the imminent collapse of the euro. Well, the it hasn't agreement. collapsed. It okay. hasn't collapsed. Okay. And despite, despite the lack of mm. any help from David Cameron, it hasn't collapsed. And they're getting their act together. Well, yeah, but but without us. From, from, from now on, do you, are your two parties going to get on as badly <laughs> as you two are? I mean, is this a demonstration are, of what the coalition is going to be like? We have a deal, and we signed up to a deal on Europe which Mr. Jenkin and his friends have never accepted. They basically don't trust David Cameron. They think he should have won. Uh, he didn't. The well, fact is that a deal is a deal, and all the time you're trying to undermine it, and it's deeply damaging well, for I Britain's think, position in Europe Bernard and Jenkin, in I'm the world. Sorry, we've got, to, we've got to leave it there. This will go on and on. That's all from Newsnight tonight. Jeremy's back on Monday, and you never know, we might have something else to talk about by then. Have a great weekend. <laughs>